All right. Why don't we uh, get started? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the President's Forum. So what a great lineup we have of recent graduates and a great faculty colleague here. And thank you all so much for coming. This is a uh, cap of an important day here at Hobart and William Smith, where we launched a $400 million capital campaign that will be important as we go forward uh, into our third century at Hobart and William Smith. It will be important for financial aid. It will be important for the <clears throat> science, new science building that will evolve here over the next few years and a lot of good things that you'll be hearing about. So in that fun spirit of a launch, we also want to go back in time a little bit about this uh, current status of being Hobart and William Smith reaching carbon neutrality a year early which is a great achievement for the institution, a lot of hard work by a lot of people here and those who preceded us, um, and an important distinction, because this brings us to some pretty notable uh, distinction of being one of 11 colleges and universities in the nation who have reached that point. So we begin first with a... <laughs> so that is a good thing. Um, so we want to go back in time a little bit to those early architects and then bring forth some people who've been really thinking about this space, working in this space, about where sustainability goes uh, into the future. But first, we have a little um, recognition of some of our colleagues here. Uh, we're great to have uh, so many students and our faculty and staff colleagues and folks from Geneva who have worked really hard and are working really hard to advance environmental protection and sustainability in the city of Geneva and in the town of Geneva. So first, I'd like to recognize Mr. Charles Cox, who's the co-chair of the Green Committee here in Geneva. Thank you very much for being here. Richard Cox, I'm sorry. What did I say? Charles? Yeah. Sorry. Richard Cox. Um, and Mark Venuti, who is the town supervisor for the town of Geneva. <clears throat> Mark and I were just talking that the town of Geneva, right next to the city of Geneva, uh, is a clean energy community. They just got a $175,000 grant pursuing uh, a more aggressive work in solar and EVs. And so it reflects the beauty of this region, uh, the important people that are a part of it. Former city council, Ken Camera, who spent a lot of his time on energy and uh, environmental protection. We recognize you as well. And a Hobart graduate. So we have a little videotape from uh, former Vice President Al Gore, who was made aware of this, and uh, wanted to send in his congratulations. I'm delighted to join you today, albeit virtually, to recognize the Hobart and William Smith community for its truly significant contributions to the growing climate action movement on our nation's college and university campuses. I've had the privilege of knowing your president, Mark Guerin, for decades, and he's always been a, a trusted advisor to me, and we've worked together on so many things, and I know that he is an invaluable steward of the causes that are most important to the students at Hobart and William Smith, particularly the defining issue of our lifetimes, the climate crisis. Seventeen years ago, with the support of an engaged and vocal student body, President Guerin was a charter signatory of the American College and University President's climate commitment. Since then, I know that the Hobart and William Smith community has worked diligently to take meaningful action on the climate crisis. And I'm incredibly impressed by the wide variety of approaches that you've utilized to cut greenhouse gas pollution, protect biodiversity, and reduce the school's overall environmental impact. You've launched campus-wide recycling and composting efforts, increased the abundance of native plants, and reduced the use of pesticides. You've embraced electric vehicles and improved the energy efficiency of your buildings. I also understand that you're now home to one of the largest solar installations of any higher education institution in the state. 
So I'm proud to offer the Hobart and William Smith community my hearty congratulations on all of the wonderful progress you've made in these past 17 years. But I know my friend Mark will likely not be surprised to hear that I'm speaking to you today not only to congratulate you, but also to ask you to do yet more. Your collective efforts have already made Hobart and William Smith a national leader in, cl in campus climate action, but your work is not complete. Yeah, that's the same uh, for all of us. As leaders, you have the obligation to strive for even more significant progress uh, and should continue to serve as a standard bearer for other colleges and universities. That means first and foremost that you've got to do all you can to protect the progress you've already made and guard against any kind of backsliding that we've seen uh, elsewhere in the country uh, at times. Uh, it also means doing more to tackle the hard to abate emissions and reduce reliance on offsets. They have a role to play, but a small one. And it means reevaluating any connections to the fossil fuel industry. And above all, it means taking what you've learned about climate action at Hobart and William Smith and applying that knowledge to your efforts off campus, whether in your neighborhoods, your networks, at your jobs, or in your civic engagement. The future really is in your hands. And if you ever doubt for a moment the ability of the world outside of Hobart and William Smith to act on the climate crisis, please always remember that the will to act is itself a renewable resource and we can renew it every day. Thank you for what you're doing. So, the will to act is itself a renewable. What a great line. That's great. I did not write that form. It was a, <laughs> you know. um, so let's go back in time a bit with this panel that we have before you here. I'll introduce them, and then we'll go through a little storytelling and going back in time. Let me begin to my left with Clancy Brown, who's a graduate of the class of 09. She's currently a science educator in North Carolina. But it was Clancy Brown who, in 2006, came into my office in Cox Hall and suggested that I become an original charter signator to the president's climate commitment um, that year so that we would be reach a level of climate neutrality by 2025. So when we talk about many great ideas, when we talk about important movements, there is the power of an idea at its very inception. And the voice of that important effort was Clancy Brown's. And I'm grateful to her, and we welcome her back to campus. I, Clancy's a twofer here. Because in addition to this great distinction, when she graduated, she joined the Peace Corps and served in Mozambique. So let's give it up for that. <laughs> um, Jamie Landy from the class of 08, currently lives with his wife and young son in Maine. But he was the college's first sustainability coordinator. And we'll talk about that and bring us back into time of what that meant, what you did in the preparation uh, that has brought us to this important achievement of the status a year early. Welcome back, Jamie. And last, a face well known to everyone in this room, Professor Tom Drennan, a Stein professor uh, in management and entrepreneurship. But it was Professor Drennan was the first call I met after Clancy, I made after Clancy left my office. He really did so much to uh, birth and um, expand our environmental studies, working with Professor Hafman as we created the Finger Lakes Institute in really bringing prominence, expanding with our current tremendous faculty colleagues, uh, and really has been very engaged to this very day in making sure that we reached this uh, important date. Some of us left, some of us came back. <laughs> the consistent voice here, the consistent thread in the achievement of reaching carbon, carbon neutrality is Professor Tom Jordan. A 
allow me to recognize from the audience another colleague retired from Hobart and William Smith. He was our vice president for finance, so the chief financial officer. And after I did what Clancy told me to do, uh, we had a huge task in order to organize that, to work with the board, to imagine that. And I suggested to our vice president for finance at the time, Pete Polinak, that he chair that committee. He wisely suggested we bring Tom Drennan into this as co-chair, but from the administrative side, from the financial side, and you can only imagine the complexities at that time, it was Pete Polinak, and we warmly welcome you back, Pete. So just to bring us back in time and to have a little fun when we start, I asked communications if they could find a photo from 2007. This may depress some of us, <laughs> but there we are signing the President's Climate Commitment. <laughs> I still have that tie, I think. Um, Clancy is right there to my left. That is Professor Tom Drennan to my right. Wow. Looking good there, Tom. Yeah. Nice shirt. Um, <laughs> Kathy Williams, former colleagues. Pete is there, former deans. But that was what kind of memorialized this commitment. So, Clancy, if I could, let me start with you in terms of walking us back to how you thought about this, how you heard about it, uh, your experience in bringing us to this day. Sure. Can you all hear me? Not yet. Sure. Um, so I think the, the real beginning was um, when I got involved with the Campus Greens. And that was my first year at Hobart and William Smith, and I hadn't found my place here yet, and I was feeling nervous about college, and I was wondering, you know, what it was going to be like, and then they just really welcomed me, and there was a group of seniors there who had been running the Greens Club, who ran the Green Campus Greens Co-op House, and um, I saw that students at this campus had the ability to make changes on the campus, and that really inspired me. And then, um, and then I took Professor Drennan's environmental economics class, which came highly recommended. Um, and I, I'm not an econ person at all, but I said, okay, I'll try it. <laughs> and I loved it. It was fascinating. Um, it made me stretch myself in areas I hadn't really practiced before. And it felt really relevant. And I thought, you know, this, this stuff matters. And then, actually, uh, I think you got an email about another college that was doing a, um, an emissions uh, inventory, carbon emissions inventory, and yes. Yes. Forwarded, it to, forwarded it to me with a line like, hey, this might be a good honors project for someone, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and I, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And I did um, my, the, the next semester I did an independent study with Professor Drennan and did my best effort at a carbon footprint uh, right. of the campus. And that was really an experience. I got to work with all kinds of people who I hadn't met before. I mean, folks from buildings and grounds, folks from administration, um, to understand what we were doing at the time. And I came up with a number that was concerning to me. I think it was nine almost 10,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide a year, um, like five, five metric tons per student, something like that. And I thought, okay, well, I don't want my report to be filed away. Uh, like, let's do something with this. Let's make a change. And I felt like I had people behind me in the Campus Screens Club. I felt like I had professors who were supportive and interested. And um, it was a collective effort. Uh, I think, you know, I... I had talked with Professor Drennan about my results and about the idea of doing something with them. And I talked with Campus Greens about it, and I said, let's, let's make something happen. Um, and we kind of put together our own little committee within the Campus Greens Club. We started talking to other student clubs. We went to student government, and we pitched the idea. Um, we went to some of the other clubs, and, and they got on board as well. We talked to other professors, and they were really in favor. And uh, they helped me put together the proposal that I eventually presented to President Guerin. So, um, you know, that, that was definitely a group effort from, from quite a few people who were, who were invested in this. Mm -hmm. And 
put together my little portfolio when I presented it. It's and very impressive. President yeah. Gearing kind of listened and nodded and <laughs> <laughs> did it. I do that very well. Yeah. Didn't give anything away <laughs> at all. And I haven't talked to Tom yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was very, yeah, very political about it. And I, um, but, you know, I thought I have no idea <laughs> right. what he actually thinks about this. Um, <laughs> and, but, but uh, that, that was in the spring of 2006. And then convocation in 2007, the beginning of the school year, we had the announcement that you were going to sign the commitment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that was the beginning of, of kind of a movement, I yeah, think, awesome. um, that kept going obviously um, long after I graduated. And so it's been really incredible to see something that my cohort initiated actually coming to fruition and ahead of schedule. Right, I know, here we are. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it is actually a dream come true. Well, for all of us, and thank you for your leadership and generosity and how that was formulated, um, but it was very well presented. So, Tom, at that point, take us back, position us all here in that moment, what this meant for the institution. We had many conversations over the spring and summer, so by the time, as Nancy said, at convocation, I was able to announce this. But bring us back then and how you thought this was an important step forward. Yeah, I personally have always known that climate change was an issue since 1988 was when I got hooked on the issue of climate change and realized that was something I really cared about and wanted to do something about. And so um, teaching environmental economics, getting students like Clancy excited about it, showing them that there is actually a way we can do this was what I am all about still. Um, but yeah, we were not very far, you know, and it's like, okay, what does carbon neutrality actually even mean? We didn't really even know. It's right. like, okay, we have to get rid of all fossil fuels, all electricity. Um, Got to stop heating our, you know, buildings with natural gas and taking hot showers and driving and all that. Hmm, that sounds impossible. So, but it launched a process. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we didn't have much at all then. Um, so again, over the course of many years, I think the most important part about this is to set a process in place where we had a committee of like 10 people who met once a month and hashed out ideas. And from that committee came the idea that, um, um, you know, we could do some big things. First, we bought some wind from Fenner, New York, not that far. That was our first thing. Again, always with students on projects. Had a couple of students actually then study wind and try to figure out how we could put wind turbines on campus. And the answer is we really couldn't. They came up with an idea for one up by the tennis courts and it would power two dorm rooms. It was like, no, that's not, you know, we gotta go bigger than that. And so, um, um, but what we found was we could buy, and any of you can, by the way, you can buy your electricity from wind or solar now. It is your choice. So that was the first decision we made was to buy wind. Um, and from there, we, the next big thing we did that I'm so proud of, and so many students and faculty and staff were involved, were the two giant solar farms that we have, um, powering about 50, 55% of our campus power. Um, I took Clancy and Jamie to the oh, Gates good. Road project okay. today, and we walked around. Um, it's pretty amazing. For those who haven't been there, I'm happy to take you. Mm -hmm. We have 18,800 solar panels powering 50% of our electricity. That is huge. And um, so projects like that. And then we had to keep talking, and we'll... We'll come back to some of the other things as we continue on. But basically, we knew that it was a giant step. The solar and the wind took care of our electricity, but then we had to take care of everything else. And I think we'll come back to that as we talk. But Tom, just while we're there, yeah. because, you know, it wasn't always a straight line. No. Right? And so, and as a matter of public policy, our friends are here from the community, <laughs> the city, and the town. There were some... Bumps. Bumps. Yes. Along the way. That kind of, I think, is affirming for everyone. You know, sometimes when you celebrate something, you think it was just a straight line of success. And we had some challenges along the way that I think you should position here in the narrative of yeah. our history. You all remember we used to own a farm? We had a farm for a while. 
the current students don't even know this because we don't anymore. Um, but we were going to put we were going to put 10 acres of solar panels there. Um, real lesson we learned is that not everyone loves solar panels, and uh, the community that lived near the solar panels were not happy with the idea, to put it mildly. And so that was a uh, a major bump in the road. I've told my students the whole story many times. That was a night that I um, I felt like uh, they actually they made me feel like I was a dirty industrialist who was just out to um, grab their land. And I was like, wow, this is interesting place for me to be. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we decided, okay, that wasn't the right solution. Um, but the good thing about that, my favorite part of that story is we had already signed a contract with a, a solar company that we were mm -hmm. going to build the solar farm. And the contract actually said if we didn't build it by December 2016, we had to start paying them $50,000 a month. There's nothing that motivates a president and a vice president of finance more than, we're going to start paying for something and get nothing back in return. And so we actually, with a couple of people, we started looking for land that you know we could make happen. And not only did we find one site, we found two, and so not... So we didn't just do 10 acres, we did 20 acres in two different places, and that never would have happened without that speed bump. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the lesson was, there were two lessons. One, we should have done, and it's not, this is on, it was definitely not a mark. It was, we should have talked to the community more about what we were doing before we just tried to do it. That's a real lesson for everyone. Talk to the community, get them involved. We actually listened to the company who said, oh, no, we've done this before, we'll take care of it. No, we blew it. So that's my big lesson from that. Yeah, for all of us. And we no. learned. Yep. And so the town of Geneva felt very strongly about it. And um, we found other options. And it's pretty awesome that we got it done within a year anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not just a story of NIMBY. But there's, there's a dimension, of, not in my backyard, right? But it's kind of respectful listening to yes. our neighbors, yes. right, that yes. I think the point he makes. And as a matter of public policy, because I think about that time as well over the years, but I think the good news, thanks to a lot of hard work, is that we're in a better position, these places, better placed, respectful of our neighbors and here. Yeah. Jamie, the first sustainability <laughs> coordinator here, kind of explain that to our colleagues here in the room, uh, what that meant. You were the very first. Being the first at anything is hard to do uh, in the portfolio and what you were working on at the time, because I think it is a part of this ascendant completion to the point we're here at today. Yeah, certainly. Um, <clears throat> so uh, President Guerin signed the President's Climate Commitment under uh, Clancy and Tom's guidance, and then it was, uh, okay, now what? Um, and I, I was in my uh, senior year, um, had been working on a composting project. Oh, yeah. as actually, uh, Kathy Regan and Jared Whedon uh, had a bone to pick with styrofoam cups on campus. They were done with styrofoam. Yep, that's right. And um, uh, there was a, a compostable plastic or serviceware that had come out during that time frame, yeah. um, but it required an industrial composting facility, a facility that was at a scale where the windrows would get hot enough to break down the plastics, turn it back into a soil. So I did an independent study with uh, Tom, and uh, we found a, a gentleman in uh, Trumansburg, New York, just down the road, and he was uh, uh, able to take the compostable serviceware and process it. Um, we got the, the, the nod to pilot uh, while I was uh, interning over the summer, and um, that resulted in a, uh, a, a job opportunity, more or less. So um, I stuck around, and um, we started a yellow bike program. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did um, a, a more uh, thorough greenhouse gas inventory. Um, we started to uh, look at energy efficiency and the built environment um, the scaling center, I think, was going up at the time. Yep. Right around the that space time. didn't yeah. exist. Yeah. And um, you know, we we were looking at lead of uh, uh, leadership uh, in environment and energy design, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. And um, uh, a number of the lead uh, attributes 
that would qualify you for the certificate are in this building, right? Um, and and um, have since been part of the built environment um, uh, at the campuses. So uh, it, it was a great opportunity for me to get involved to build off the momentum that was of already already rolling, and I think to help the committee and that energy focus uh, to execution. But what I found to be uh, really uh, in, engaging as I went through that process myself was um, the opportunity to work with students and to bring them along, right? This wasn't, this wasn't a top-down. It was really mm -hmm. a, a bottom-up and a top-down meeting mm -hmm. nicely in the middle. Yeah. But talk about the public education piece of this from Trailless efforts in the dining room. Trailless Tuesday. Remember yeah. Trailless Tuesday? Oh, absolutely. How could I forget? Replay the tape for people because we don't have trays any day here now. But oh, there we initially, go. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so food waste, big deal, right? Um, extra methane um, from landfills, uh, just uh, in, in general, not good. Um, so you know, a, a lot of communication uh, to to faculty, staff, students. Um, Trailless Tuesday, recycling, right? Reinforcing what goes where. It can be confusing and complicated. We have folks from all over the world who come mm -hmm. here, and mm -hmm. they have different systems. Mm -hmm. So educating them on, on, on how that would work. Um, and I, I think that we, we came up with some very compelling uh, messaging that folks bought into, and I'm sure continue to buy into. I mm -hmm. see recycling and composting stations. Right. I mean, fantastic. Yep. Yeah. It has your name all over it. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> no, it's good. Um, well, Tom, then, as you position this part of the conversation that we have before we bring up other colleagues, how do you reflect back on time and observe this moment now? Uh, it's so interesting to me. I forgot all about that Jamie did an independent study as well. <laughs> and I, I don't think we said, I think you were a poli sci, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, poli sci, and math was not your friend, right? Definitely not, no. So I have this moment, I remember him putting together that first report on how we were going to get yeah. to today. Oh, right. boy. I wish I had that graphic, because <laughs> we had one figure in there that showed our pathway, and it was like this. It was like crazy. You know, it, yeah. it took him like two weeks yeah. to come up with this I did this go graph to business and, school eventually. Okay, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was... Um, um, but you know, he he saw then how we had to get there, and we knew it wouldn't be linear. Um, but um, I'd forgotten that you had a compost. That was when we had students trying to stir it, right? And there was bees. And, oh, it was crazy! Yeah, and yeah. they got stung. Yeah, I mean, it was a mess, right? It's compost is hard. It's hard. Yeah. So now, right? I mean, most of you probably don't even realize, but all of your food scraps, everything from Saga, you don't eat or throw away it all is composted now. I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. We have fallen, I'm gonna be honest, we've fallen backwards on recycling. Jamie used to run Recycle Mania. Recycle Mania. Every fall. And during that time, we would hit 35, 38%. I March think Madness, got, March Recycle Mania. Mania. Yes, that was it. And compete um, with Colgate. Yes, we yeah. did. Yeah, we kicked yeah. the bus. Yeah. 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 yeah, but you know, it took we a lot of students back. and a lot yeah. of personalities. And that's what, you know, that's what's so fun about being here is working of course, with the students on projects like this. And I've already, you know, I got several people in this audience that I am like pushing in different directions. And now they know if you get an email from me with dot, dot, because <laughs> I do that. <laughs> it's really funny to think about. So yeah. Clancy, if I may, with you here as an educator, what do you take from this experience? You've had the benefit now of thinking about this since we invited you back, but what do you, take from this experience into your professional life or perhaps your interests as a citizen? I, I would say when I, so when I came into college, I didn't think I had a lot to contribute. I didn't think that I had that much value because I didn't know very much. And I saw these professors who were highly educated people and I thought, what, I mean, I, you know, I had nothing, nothing to bring to the table. And then um, what I've realized now is that young people are the driving force. Mm -hmm. They have the passion. They have the inspiration. They think in creative, innovative ways. And us mature folks have the wisdom and experience, but we, we're stuck in our ruts and our ways of thinking. And to bring in that young perspective mm -hmm. is incredibly valuable. And I think when the two can come together, 
when you have a mentor and a mentee or when you have an inspired young person and then, um, you know, a more wise and experienced person to help guide them, that, that has incredible potential. Mm. And I see that in my high school classroom too. Um, students who are learning just the basics and yet they ask the most interesting questions because no one has told them not to. And, um, yeah. and I love that. And I think there's, there's, there's a lot of power there and I think we need to um, let young people know that their voice is important and valuable and that they're bringing something to the table that we need. Love that. And Jamie, from your point of view in Maine, I mean, do, do you come reflecting back on this in time? Does this leave you, as you look to the future, as you look at your son's future, does something like this leave you with hope or concern or how do you place an observation like today? Yeah, um, I, I would say hope. I mean, we, I'm in Midcoast, Maine. Um, and we got clobbered this winter right. by some big storms. I'm sure national news, right? Yeah. Houses floating oh, yeah. through harbors. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actively involved in, in some community nonprofits that <clears throat> are uh, on the water. There's real concern about uh, how sustainable these landscapes, buildings are going to be. Um, and... Uh, they were important to me, they are important to me. Um, I'd like them to be around for my son, right? And so I think that uh, the sustainable mindset, right, using, using the lens, the framework, as we think about um, how to adapt, how to be more resilient, we think about change and, and evolution, which is necessary, um, is, cr is critical. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm absolutely hopeful and, and optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that he will have a bright future, mm -hmm. um, but I, I also know that, that we do need to evolve and adapt and change, and in that, in that is opportunity. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Join me in thanking this first part of our panel here. This is great. This is great. So we are going to bring up one more chair there, Tom. If you grab that chair, we will slide down, and let's bring up three other graduates, and one will join us remotely uh, to the stage. Come on in here, everybody. Join us, yeah. Set change. Let me begin down at the end by uh, not reintroducing uh, Tom Drennan, um, but Dan Gadigan, who's from the class of 2011. He's the Vice President of Environmental social and governance and sustainability at Cerberus Capital Management, where he is responsible for ESG work and sustainability strategy oversight and implementation uh, across their investment portfolios. ESG being a very interesting dynamic space in the economy and an important role. So welcome back, uh, Dan. Um, Emmeline Reed, class of 23, who's also uh, in our master's program, graduated with a degree in environmental studies, now in the master's in management, where she serves as a sustainability graduate assistant under the guidance of Professor Drennan. And her work included spearheading so much of the very critical uh, data collection report and conducting a thorough greenhouse uh, gas emissions inventory. Erin Kluge, who's also a graduate from Hobart William Smith and also enrolled in the uh, master's program was an environmental studies and philosophy major. She, is, last summer, along with Professor Drennan, uh, researched and advised all of us in the administration on purchasing carbon offsets, in the important space that we've been talking about. One of the ingredients and levers to achieve carbon neutrality. She continues her, her work with Emily as a sustainability uh, Emmeline, rather, as a sustainability graduate assistant, uh, collecting uh, data to complete this important STARS report. And then lastly, we welcome via Zoom, I hope, uh, Jamie Mulligan. Jamie, welcome. There he is. There he is. Hi. Good. Jamie is from the class of 07. He is a senior scientist at Amazon, where he is the head of the carbon 
neutralization. He's the technical strategy and investment lead of the, for the company's investments in climate change mitigation for Amazon. He also serves as one of 12 expert judges for the $100 billion X Prize for carbon removal. So four great graduates of Hobart and William Smith, along with Professor Drennan, to take this conversation now into some of the elements of um, both our status and carbon neutrality, and I think perhaps for many of us, some of the public policy implications. Uh, and professionally what it means uh, with um, Jamie and as well as Dan and from the good work on campus that our graduate students are affording. So uh, perhaps, Tom, it may make sense to start with you in terms of the role of renewable resources here on campus and sources of it. We've talked about solar. We've, we've mentioned wind, our sustainability initiatives that cover so many things, and how these sources are integrated into our campus operations. Okay, so as, as we talked about, 18,000 solar panels, pretty impressive number. Um, but something you need to know is that that solar power, how does it get to campus? We don't know. It goes into the grid. <laughs> And so that's part of the whole thing. We built these solar farms, the power goes into the grid, and whoever needs that power gets that power, but we know how much we're producing. So that's you know, one, of the, one of the key concepts to understand is we have no way of knowing that this is coming from solar. We're just producing that power and putting it on the grid because that's the most efficient way of doing it. Um, likewise, with the wind, we are buying wind power. We are buying the rights, saying that this is wind that's being generated that wouldn't have been generated had we not purchased it. So we are buying our power. And again, I want to emphasize, any of you can do this. You just have to decide that you're going to buy solar and wind, and you can do it. And I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but other than that, on campus, one of my great early joys, at going back to 2012 now, um, 2012, 2014, I don't remember what year, we put in our first electric charging stations. I had a 2012 Chevy Volt, which I actually am still driving with 140,000 miles. Um, um, and I was the only person who plugged in because nobody else had one, right? Now I can't even plug in because we have some 41 unique electric car users on campus, which is pretty awesome. And I'm here to tell you that our plan for this summer is to add 14 to 18 more charging stations. So, you know, we're gonna, so, yeah. So we keep, we keep pushing in those directions. And again, I couldn't imagine that. Honestly, it was like, I was the only person using this charging station and it was a little embarrassing. It was like, why do we put these in? So Drennan could charge his car? But well, I got a little pushback on that. But, um, um, but now, again, it's, it's many of you I see out here are using them as well, and that's awesome. It is awesome. Yeah. Emma, let's build on that because there's, there's so much reference tonight um, about our greenhouse gas inventory. Yes. Could you situate that? What does that entail? How, do you, how would you yeah. best so explain? The greenhouse gas inventory is a pretty comprehensive report. It covers scopes one, two, and three emissions. So for those of you that don't know, scope one is the direct emissions. That's gonna include um, heating, campus vehicles. Um, so heating, I mean like the natural gas usage on campus. It includes fertilizers, refrigerants, and other chemicals. For scope two, that's gonna be our purchased electricity. Um, of course, half of our electricity comes from our solar field. And then the other half, roughly, is from our wind wrecks. And then for our scope three emissions, that's when it gets a little more complicated. So that's all of our indirect emissions. Um, Aaron and I completed <laughs> a big inventory of commuting, so students, faculty, and staff coming to and from campus, um, students coming to and from campus um, from home during breaks. We have the athletics travel, study abroad travel, business travel. We included solid waste in scope three. So scope three is pretty extensive. That's where um, a good portion of our emissions come from. So around 60% of our emissions come from our scope one and 40% come from scope three. 
And the significance of this inventory mm -hmm. is what? So the inventory was really important at this time to determine how many offsets we needed to buy in order to be climate neutral. Um, and also it helps us determine like, where we need to focus our efforts. So where are our emissions coming from and where can we make it better? Yep, perfect. And that's a perfect lead and then Aaron to you in terms of, mm -hmm. we've heard so much about offsets. You are our current offset expert here on the panel. Talk to us about what you've been compiling and the significance of what that means both now and into the future. Absolutely. So over the summer, right after I walked the stage, I got an email from Professor Drennan with a dot, dot, dot about <laughs> that we are in the final stages of endorsing uh, from a committee and we got approval to purchase carbon offsets. So for those who may not know, offsets are essentially an investment that we make to support extracting carbon or any other greenhouse gases uh, from anywhere in the world or for us we wanted to try to stay localized in the United States. So what I did over the summer was ensuring are these offsets legitimate, are they quantifiable, and will they be something that would enact actual change in communities. So we're not just greenwashing in our purchase, we're not just investing in something and hoping that it would produce uh, carbon offsets equivalents, but it would actually create change. So the first one that we purchased was advanced refrigeration. So when you go to Walmart, you, there are these giant refrigerators. You can buy anything. Um, those are mega corporations that can afford the latest and greatest technology to ensure that those uh, refrigerants aren't con contributing to any more greenhouse gas emissions. But then when you look at smaller mom and pop uh, convenience stores, they might not have the funds to afford that. That's where our investment comes in. So we invested in projects to help those smaller grocery stores switch out their more harmful refrigerants for an advanced one. And then our second offset, which is actually up on stage, is a cook stove. So we wanted to keep our projects in the U.S. We also wanted to look at things that would help not just environmental change, but also health. So we invested in a cook stove project in Honduras. So uh, often families in Honduras, mostly women and children, are uh, when they would cook things in the home, it's all that smoke will stay inside the house and it can lead to respiratory issues and also various emissions. So we are, the company will go in and actually explain how to use these stoves and go to families who actually want to use it, not just enforcing this new technology, like seeing who wants to use it and implement it. And we have one up here, which is really cool. So that's basically it's what, awesome. Yeah, and based on the greenhouse gas inventory report, we are we bought enough, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And there's but there's options. We yes. Tom and I just learned of one recently at a luncheon. I mean, there's the selection of what that is is a critical determination, right? Absolutely. So we now let's turn to to Dan and Jamie because they bring a perspective as graduates into the field. And Dan, I guess if I could start with you, you're in an interesting space in the private sector of ESG investing. Talk to us about the takeaways. That, first of all, define it. Tell us what that is, because we have a lot of students here interested in environmental studies in the space, interested in finance, as well as thinking through a life of consequence. <laughs> sure. um, talk to us about what is ESG investing and, and what it means in your professional career. Sure. So when you hear ESG, you're really thinking three things, environmental, social, and governance. And when people talk about investing in this space, they're asking a whole bunch of things, but really, what are we looking at to think about making a difference and an impact? So if I look at one investment versus another, I can t say, kind of compare them apples to apples, how do they do on ESG versus how do they do on ESG? A lot of things that go into those three letters, but that's sort of the high level of what that means. This was the second part. Just the takeaways of how, yeah. in, in terms of the professional, I guess when I say takeaway, I mean kind of the professional um, backgrounds of folks that you see in like or sure. adjacent industries that are preparing yeah. for this role. Sure. Within. So you've got traditional ESG work streams, like in the east side, you've got people who are environmental scientists, we've got geologists, and we've got people who clean up, you know, uh, brownfield sites. On the social side, you have people who have worked in HR, who have dealt with indigenous populations to work on you know, climate resolutions for projects. 
but on the governance side, you have people in the compliance sector, uh, people who work in cybersecurity. So you really have a whole range of people who come together to work on these issues. What's new to ESG now, and where I have made most of my career so far, is that climate is now part of this ESG package. And so when we talk about ESG, we're now also including a carbon footprint here. So people like these impressive women who are working on a project that I could have only dreamed to work on when I was in school, um, that kind of work is now involved in ESG. Mm. Right? So whenever we're looking at something that we're also asking, in addition to these traditional ESG work streams, what is your carbon footprint? Awesome. And Jamie, thank you so much for taking the time to, to join us. Uh, you are in an important role as a senior scientist, and Amazon is obviously the largest online retailer. How do you think about um, your firm, um, and realistically, what can be accomplished, given the, the expansive nature of Amazon and what it can mean in our economy, and I guess on the appreciative side, what you can do for greater sustainability, environmental impact? Yeah, great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I would say that Amazon's scale and the complexity of our business is essentially a microcosm of the global economy. Um, so far, it, we, we've had some good, some good sort of breakthroughs that that showcase what can be done, um, uh, and we have lots of things in motion that um, sort of put, push that deeper. So, Amazon has a a, a commitment like the one that Hobart and William Smith just accomplished. We gave ourselves a few more years to accomplish it. Um, 2040, our footprint's a little bit bigger than uh, HWS. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're about, I don't know about that, Jamie, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, about, we're about 70 million metric tons a year. Wow. Um, and we're a fast-growing company. Uh, we have uh, we have an airline. We build buildings. Uh, of course, we have delivery um, logistics operations. We have an agricultural supply chain uh, for worldwide grocery and so on. But of some some things to note, um, we, we made a 100% renewable energy commitment by 2025. We're almost there. Um, we've put about 25 gigawatts of wind and solar online. That's about the grid of Belgium. Uh, so that's a big one. Um, we are uh, electrifying our, our last mile delivery fleet uh, with Rivian vehicles as well as um, from other other manufacturers as well. Um, we're, we have a $2 billion uh, venture capital fund specifically dedicated to investing in emerging climate technologies that we can use to decarbonize our business, but also the other sectors, other, other actors in the same sectors that we operate in. So we're investing in green hydrogen and low carbon concrete, um, hyper efficient HVAC systems. Uh, the list goes on. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of interesting things happening. So it's an exciting place to be. Um, every day we get to cook up kind of crazy new ideas to, to tackle another piece of our footprint uh, or to create an impact outside of our footprint, um, it, which might lead to offsets. But I really view that as a, a, a channel for climate finance, for, for critical climate solutions that aren't on track and, and need that kind of finance from companies like Amazon uh, today uh, and, and not only in 2040 and beyond. That's awesome. No, thank you. Um, well, let's go on to questions, and I think we have uh, Sophia and Jack Ibsen are getting some mics. I think before we go out <clears throat> to your questions, let me pose something, because we do have the uh, student government leads here, it occurs to me, uh, as our uh, microphone bearers. Talk to us about some of the things your governments are thinking about in terms of this space and what you might take out of this conversation. Sophia? Right, so we, um, this semester we launched our sustainability series um, as we were hearing about the exciting news about, um, you know, becoming carbon neutral. So we um, have been hosting a number of events and initiatives this semester specifically um, to help contribute to these overarching efforts that the colleges are pursuing. So something exciting on the horizon for us is um, I know the Yellow Bike program was mentioned a little bit earlier in the conversation. Um, it's been renamed to Bike HWS, and uh, student governments actually purchased 20 new bikes, which will be uh, which will be launched on Monday, actually. So if anyone's interested, the weather's nice yeah. the last five weeks of the semester. You can grab a bike from us on Monday and um, 
get riding around campus. So that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, Jackson has another uh, exciting update on that front as well, if you want to talk about the trees. Yeah. yeah, I'll just say quickly, we've been hosting a, a whole number of different sustainability related events. Um, and I think one thing that is brought up is like, you know, it takes an army, it takes a, it takes a big group to accomplish some of these lofty goals. And so we've been collaborating with a lot of different groups on campus, uh, specifically HW, our Campus Greens as well, which was also mentioned earlier. So big shout out to them as well. Uh, but we've uh, helped clean up the community garden. Uh, obviously, we're launching the bikes. Uh, we've had just earlier this week, uh, we worked with Ready to our real estate and architecture club on campus. Um, we brought a uh, guest alumni speaker uh, who is in the passive house design as well. So educational, mm. active things um, and coming up as well. Uh, Sophia alluded to, we'll be planting uh, several different trees along some pathways as well. So just trying to, you know, bolster these efforts uh, and, and help continue some of the work that has been launched here and, and you know, help uh, get students as involved as possible uh, in this process. Good. Thank you both. We should applaud all that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's go out to your questions. We also have uh, Jamie and Clancy available for your questions. We have the history. We have some contemporary good work on the, that Emmeline and Aaron have referenced in terms of our inventory and offsets. We have professional perspectives from Dan and from Jamie, the other Jamie, uh, and obviously Professor Drennan as our through line here on all of these things. So. Let's go out for some questions on any or all of the above topics. Right back there. Uh, firstly, thank you and congratulations for all the work you guys have done. Uh, this is kind of a question aimed at whoever is responsible for our investments in terms of like the environmental impact. Uh, notable alumni, 2013, Maddie Mead uh, founded a company called Hempa Texture, and uh, they have some great. Um, alternatives to insulation uh, that, you, that use hemp and um, polymer binders to offset uh, carbon emissions. Um, have you guys looked at reaching out to him to replace the insulation in the buildings at HWS? Um, it's a carbon, or carbon negative uh, insulator, so I was just wondering what you guys thought about that. Well, that's probably me um, to answer, <laughs> although any of you are welcome to answer on behalf of the board uh, of trustees. The investor, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would say this. The investments of the institution are managed by the Board of Trustees as an active investment committee. And obviously the board is very proud and excited about all the good work that we're talking about here today. They have, they take an active role as fiduciaries to make sure that, obviously in the first instance, as we go into our third century, that we have the kind of investments uh, to secure an endowment that supports so much of the operations here. But I, what I don't know, the direct answer to your question is if they've looked at that. So I would appreciate the information on that. I remember that or reading about it from Matty Mead, uh, whether that's been reviewed. It is a committee that is always in open dialogue and conversation about our investment. So I think they would welcome it because they meet monthly. So if we could connect, I would, I would appreciate that. Can I just add a little bit to yeah. that? So Matty Mead... Um, was one of our runner-ups in a pitch contest many yep. years ago. So he did yep. not win, but yet he actually has an amazing business going. So there's a lesson there. Um, Susan, what year? Uh, it was the second year, and he lost to Space Vinyl. He lost to Space Vinyl, I remember right. That. Which, uh, right. yeah. Yep. Yep. But um, Matty, last year, won a, a $500,000 grant in the Grow New York competition. Um, and he already has a facility out in Idaho. And, you know, the new plan, as I oh, understand yeah. it, is to build one here locally. And so I think then it becomes like a no-brainer that to we need to figure out how to make that connection. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a That's great cool. story. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. I think we had one right over there. Then we'll get back over here. Um, hello, congratulations on reaching carbon neutrality. That's an amazing achievement. Um, my question is, now that you've reached this amazing achievement, what, as we know, you know, work never stops. So what is the future goals and objectives now to make sure that you are staying where you're supposed to be with carbon neutrality or even pushing past that? Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Okay. 
So we were just talking about this before the forum, Aaron and I, and we decided that the first thing that the colleges should do is hire a sustainability manager. So now the environmental sustainable efforts going on are fractured a little bit across campus. Um, mm -hmm. We got campus green doing stuff, um, student government and student engagement doing um, various sustainability actions, and a sustainability manager would bring it all together and make sure that those focus um, those efforts are focused. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think another thing you just want to speak to is climate change and addressing climate resilience is always and should be a community effort, whether that is globally or locally or it at the HWS community. And when we were speaking about this earlier, we were thinking if we had a question like this, would we address the individual or the community? But it's honestly paradoxical when you think about solutions because there are things that should be up to the individual, but also on the collective effort. And so I think as like, we are leaving, we're graduating this May, but if there are active students who are passionate and have innovative ideas that might seem crazy, like committing to climate neutrality in a, however many years, that was, it was seen as impossible or even implausible, but we're here. So just keeping up that momentum and addressing whether it's specifically with scope one or other offsets or other investments that we can make having students who are passionate enough and want to reach out with the sustainability email can involve campus greens um, get involved in the geneva community the G geneva greens committee um, and just uh, taking action with yourself but also thinking about it as a whole ecosystem i like that and i think the vice president's point as well to preventing backslide Right, mm -hmm. no matter how that happens. We had a question right here, I think. I think right here. Oh, and then we'll go back, yeah. Congratulations, this is fantastic. Um, I'm wondering if you've considered a feasibility study for district geothermal to heat and cool the campus, mm -hmm. and maybe a little plug, um, NYSERDA, could help pay for that. Um, it's something to look into and mm. could be done potentially with students, which is really interesting. Wow. So just wondering about That's that. Great question. Yeah, that? I, I thank you for asking that question because one of the things I didn't mention in my previous answer, I realized I missed part of my responsibility. Another great student project that happened, John, what year was that? That we had students Designed the Finger Lakes Institute, what it should look like. What year was that, John? How do you not remember? Long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> so the Finger Lakes Institute is geothermally heated and cooled. And unfortunately, it was a challenging project. And that kind of like soured us for a while. And so then whenever we mentioned geothermal, people were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. But things have changed. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I think there's some students in this room doing their SIE project that I'm hoping I'm gonna hear an awesome proposal for how we're going to do geothermal. And, and if there's nicer to money, that's awesome. Um, because yes, we really should. And when we build the new science building, we should at least like figure out whether it's an option and go that way. Um, we are not Cornell that was able to spend, I don't know how many millions, huh? Yeah, to, to run a, you know, pipe out into the lake and take cold water from deep in the lake and pull it up and cool their old campus. But there, we 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 need to do more there. That's a really good is question. Corn, is Cornell carbon neutral? No, next year. <laughs> no, no. They have a goal of twenty twenty five, but yeah, crick, crickets. Let's go right back here, Griffin. Yeah, I guess just in, in the same vein of that, moving forward, are there other renewable energy options that you're exploring? Is it possibility of like expanding the, the solar farm, um, or are we going to stay at this level and continue to bar, so continue to buy carbon uh, offsets in, in that direction? I guess that's me. <laughs> um, um, so when we built the solar farms, it was the size that New York State allowed. 10 acres was the max, and therefore developers really wanted to do it for us. When we approached them last year to see if we could build more, they're on to 100 and 200 acre projects, and we no longer matter. So um, there are other ways of doing it, community solar projects that um, we actually 
we've gotten some bids on that. That's probably be the next way we go. But absolutely that, you know, we can uh, invest in more renewables for sure. And, and we will. But again, if you like buy an electric vehicle, you know, that's I didn't quite make that connection and use one of our many new chargers we're going to have. You will be powering with, you know, solar and wind and therefore also become carbon neutral. Jamie, um, Mulligan, can I bring you into this? You're at an interesting space um, <laughs> where a lot of your colleagues and broadly within the sector are thinking about what's next, because that's the heart of a lot yes. of these questions. I'd be interested, you're the chief science, senior scientist at Amazon really thinking daily about this. What are people saying is the next level of attainment, whether it's in higher education, civic, town governments, or a big retailer like Amazon? Uh, well, for you guys, you've reached this incredible milestone. Um, of course, you can need to prevent backsliding, but, but uh, you also need to continue to drive down your emissions so that the share of offsets in that equation de declines over time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important. I also think within the offsets equation, we're going to find some of the low-hanging fruit sort of ho hopefully – uh, exhausted uh, as a result of scaled climate finance, and and the cost of those things are going to going to rise over time. We handle more innovative things that are a little bit beyond beyond the reach today. Um, so Amazon, for example, is investing in direct air capture technology that pulls CO two directly out of out of the atmosphere. That's it's a long road to build that technology up and to mainstream it, but providing that early commercial support so that. Uh, those startups and innovators can deploy and learn by doing. Um, so it's, you got to keep turning over rocks and, you know, energy is the big one. Uh, power is the big one. And then, and then transportation emissions, of course. Um, but it's all kinds of smaller sources of emissions then that um, haven't gotten the same attention because they're not the big rocks, but uh, they also matter and they add up. Um, yep. So for Amazon, it's, you know, it's packaging emissions. It's, uh, it's concrete and steel in the buildings, high, higher cost things that, you know, they're not the low hanging fruit, but, but we know we need to tackle those as well. Dan, maybe the same question from the sure. investor community. What are you hearing? What are people asking you about? So we get a lot of interest to answer the task force and climate related financial disclosures, the TCFD. That's everything that's happening now. And then what we see a lot right now coming next year and the year beyond is nature, biodiversity. So there's an actual task force now on nature-related financial disclosures, the TNFD. So there is a lot of work, and these things are related, but there's a lot that happened on climate in the last decade, and now you're going to see that same cycle happen with nature, biodiversity. Interesting. Okay, some other questions here. Let's go right here. Hi. Um, I just want to say, first off, I'm very proud to be a student that's going to a carbon neutral campus. That's really awesome to be able to say. Um, but I just had a question. I'm more curious as to what the conversation has been around divestment from fossil fuels, both at HWS, but also um, with Dan and Jamie at your various workplaces. Um, yeah. What, what are we talking about in terms of divestment from fossil fuels? Thank you. Yeah. We, uh, I, <clears throat> sorry, I can start. We spoke about this earlier in um, the environmental econ class. So th this is a really hard question. Um, a lot of companies say they're divesting, and then you look at what they're actually investing in, and they haven't really divested at all. They've sort of shifted it to another area. Um, our company, we still do buy coal and oil companies. I think the difference that you see is that we're a lot more transparent about what it is that we're buying and then what it's going to look like when we sell it. So maybe we buy something that has been, you know, fined a bunch of times for, uh, you know, their pollution. Uh, they haven't been following the EPA permitting and we're going to buy it and we're going to make sure that when we go to sell it, that it has to be locked up and we have to make sure that everything is within regulation. So we sort of buy something that's a little bit on the brown side and we try to make it more green by the time we sell it. So it's not a perfect world, but like, you know, as we start to transition the climate into a more, you know, climate neutral, everything's powered by renewables, you know, it's hard to just drop coal overnight. It's still part of our total national energy generation. So it's still part of the equation for now, 
Um, you're going to see more divestment. I think the key is how you divest from those things and what you're replacing it with, or are you just saying, I bought this thing and I made it a little bit greener and now I'm selling it. I think it's really important to focus on, you know, what are you actually doing while you hold it? And then when it's time to sell it, you know, what have you done to replace that energy? Tom, as an economist, how would you answer that question? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, even in my personal investments, I know that I have tried to make sure I don't have fossil fuel holdings because I do have an issue with that. It is incredibly hard because you buy into these funds and then you find out, oh, Chevron is one of the components because Chevron has a bunch of clean energy too, right? And so how do you separate that out? Um, you can't just say, I'm not going to buy into the, I forget what it's called, uh, responsible investment fund from our provider. You can't just say, I won't take this, the Chevron part because it's all part of a big fund. So it's, it's really complicated. So the good news is that, um, I mean, there's so much good news. I mean, that's when he says coal is still a part of our generation strategy, it's a tiny part. We've come so far. We didn't think we could come this far yep. so quickly. Um, you mean as a country? As a country, yep. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've, de we've decommissioned so many coal plants. Right. Yeah. And, and when Dan was taking my Econ 348 class in 2009, Nine. solar was 36 cents a kilowatt hour, and today it's three. 95% wow. drop. So that's a game changer. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what like politicians might say about we are going to, um, you know, what direction we're going to go. Um, the industry is moving in a very different direction. And, you know, I, I, I'd love to hear from Jamie on this. I mean, part of why Amazon is willing to, to uh, uh, go this direction is because all that solar, et cetera, that you're actually buying is, is, is cost effective now. It's not costing you more money. Is that correct? Uh, well, it... <laughs> <laughs> Depends. Uh, things are shifting a little bit, but um, it has it has become uh, cost effective to uh, a degree that we didn't think. You know, I didn't think it was possible when I was in your environmental economics class, Professor Drennan. Um, but I, I would say that we're very much taking the approach of um, proactively investing in in the clean alternatives and the innovative technologies that we think are going to run the economy in in a, in a decade and two. Um, and, and when those things come into mainstream, they're, they're better, they're cleaner, uh, they're, they're more efficient. Um, th the divestment from fossil is going to happen naturally. Um, yes. Because it's the dinosaurs are going to get left behind. Yes. Yeah. In the ground. That was a fossil. <laughs> Dead dinosaurs. So, yes. So yeah. why don't we go back there? We have another yeah. time for maybe one more question here. Um, so this is a question for Jamie at Amazon, and it's going to be a two-part question. Uh, the first one is Amazon being uh, one of the biggest e-commerce platforms and marketplace globally has quite a bit of need for packaging materials. So my first question would be, what are some steps that Amazon has been taking uh, in order to reduce packaging waste? And the second part would be strictly in terms of the allocation of financial resources, um, what is the willingness to switch to a sustainable packaging resource as um, this would reduce profit margins? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not the packaging expert, but I'll tell you what I do know, and I might get the numbers slightly off, so don't, don't uh, quote me on it. But um, I, we care deeply about packaging because it's, it's one of the kind of key interfaces with the customer. When the packaging shows up at your door, the packaging is the first thing you interact with. It's actually not a huge part of our footprint in terms of the absolute kind of carbon emissions associated with packaging versus the transportation of the package to your house, the building that it was built if, uh, to, ha to house those packages. We also have a cloud computing business and a number of other things. But on packaging, uh, we've I think we've cut packaging material by about 40% over the last several years. Um, so we're shifting from uh, kind of bulky boxes to to uh, paper mailers, which saves space in the truck, it lightweights. Those things save us carbon in the transportation. It saves carbon in the packaging itself. Uh, and those paper mailers are all curbside recyclable. And there was we went first to plastic mailers, and now we've made a commitment to to get rid of plastic. That's 
you know, take us several years, we've made significant progress in shifting from plastic to paper. That's good. Jamie, that was a uh, informed question um, <laughs> by our student here. It was one of the finalists for the pitch competition. So with an idea about uh, a more eco-friendly packaging. So you may have a follow-up uh, <laughs> email with Happy a dot, dot, dot attached <laughs> to it. Happy to have the dot, dot, dot. Uh, we're getting towards time. I suspect we could, for many of us, stay here all night. But I wanted to just come back out to Clancy and to, to Jamie. Any final thoughts? If you can join, come on up here and final thoughts, and then we'll, we'll bring it on home here. Come on up, everybody. I'll step back. Yeah, Jamie, go over there. No, no. Oh. Oh. <laughs> this is my final thought, Mark. <laughs> Clancy, some final thoughts. But just go down the aisle here. Just gonna wrap up comments. I guess um, dream big. Yes. Because you know something that feels impossible now might end up becoming a reality. And if you don't take a chance, if you don't set the bar high then you'll never make it. So that's that's the lesson I'm learning here is that, um, wow, we actually did it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And I'd, I'd like to say that um, uh, I think that Hobart and William Smith, uh, Geneva community, the Finger Lakes, presents a phenomenal opportunity for students to engage in ways that they may not have imagined when they started, mm -hmm. right? You think about the, the various independent study projects, right? Um, environmental business opportunities that came out of the pitch, yep. right? Uh, the, the, the tendrils and the threads just go on and on. You have an ESG professional, right? Uh, mm -hmm. e scientist. So I, I think that as a student, to take a moment and appreciate the fact that you have a moment, to engage in maybe ways that you hadn't initially imagined. Yeah. Um, and to go and talk to your professors and show some interest. Um, it, it's, it's a phenomenal place to be and to be educated in a phenomenal community to be in. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, John. That's awesome. Well, it, uh, it doesn't get much better than that to have really um, an extraordinary group now of one, two, three, four, five, six with Jamie Mulligan, uh, graduates back on campus, thinking through ways, reminding us of early energy and inspiration and hard work, augmented by important study and resource, and lives left in this, uh, in this important space. So um, I think Professor Drennan would be the first to say that this happens with a lot of people, what, what of has people. happened here over the yeah. course. And I know there are faculty colleagues here in the room who have touched this important space of environmental science broadly in our science division. I would like them to stand for our collective thanks for bringing us to this. <laughs> to our town neighbors and city colleagues, thank you for the partnership here in the community. Um, for me, a takeaway is just sort of a bit where we started and certainly what Clancy really nailed on her closing reflection. Is this the power of an idea and the inspiration to think big? I don't know that there's a movement that one can think of in our nation from civil rights to women's rights to LGBTQ rights to environmental rights that didn't start with America's young people. I think when you look over the history of our nation, uh, the energy that was well expressed by Clancy and evidence in 2006 has continued in all these important movements. And last for me, we live in a time where there's so many challenges, so many issues, and it's easy to get uh, concerned and depressed that nothing can ever change. It will always be thus. It's just sort of a, this one can retreat to a defeatist, nihilistic reality that things can't move, can't change. I would offer tonight 
with our colleagues here, colleagues in the room, those that have preceded us, from the faculty, from the staff, that it's an example in our little small part of the world that things can and do change. So with my thanks to everyone here tonight for your attendance, thanks so much for joining us. Great job. It's good.